Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to, um, to talk to you this morning about uh, this field. Um, of storm surges, and I gather uh, there's quite a diverse audience. Some of you know something about storm surges uh, from a physics and, uh, and uh, physical systems point of view. Others of you don't. So those of you that do know something about storm surges, apologies that I'm covering ground that you already know. Um, for others, it will be new material for you. But what I want to do is to outline um, that background of this field um, of storm surges, and particularly the impacts of these on our environment. Um, as you can see, we've put just down um, a, a, a series of the, the points that I want to cover. Um, as Ned said, uh, my background uh, is as the Professor of Physical Geography, but more importantly, um, the work that I do has been primarily upon coastal science and how um, waves, uh, as linked from storms, impact upon coastal systems and essentially are driving coastal systems, the sediments, and the way in which our beaches and coastal systems change uh, through time. Uh, and as part of that work then, I've been particularly involved in the last 10 years or so with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, in terms of modelling work, in terms of modelling uh, the future impacts of warming climate on storms and wave action and obviously the connection of that to our coastlines and how they function. So that's particularly the context from which I'm, I'm coming. So firstly, to um, outline um, quite a few projects we've been involved with in recent years that has been involved in that particular area of modelling how storms are created and what the impacts on the climate warming are. And there I can show you some of these, these sorts of projects such as Prudence from the Mediterranean, uh, Hippocas, which is more sort of North Atlantic. So there's a lot of literature out there. Um, and actually I brought a textbook which just I, I need to refer to a little later on as well. Uh, but there's a lot of literature that you can get from the EU directorate or from uh, sort of normal reference sources. And I suppose I'd better say at that point, if you don't like Wikipedia, fine. But if you have no idea what a storm surge is, there's quite a useful start as a Wikipedia. I know people hate it and shouldn't say it, but I think it's a useful thing to look at, just as a look at. Um, so what I want to do is firstly look at storm surge. What are they? Definitions, components. Uh, perhaps a little bit of the difference in the sense between what is a a surge and a tsunami, uh, because sometimes that is confusing. Uh, certainly from a sort of a coastal signal point of view, the difference between these two events is, is quite distinctly different. Um, secondly, you can see down to how do storm surges form and operate, the mechanisms, um, and then particularly the impacts of surges on water levels on the coast. And as Craig said, um, here in Cork we are particularly affected by storm surges as the pulse, the bulge of water generated by storm hits the coastline and interacts with water coming down through the river system. The conjunction of those two creates, of course, a very elevated water level. Level. And here in Cork we suffer particularly in the city from uh, those two, two controls. So the water level changes, uh, surges with climate warming and sea level rise, just the, the relationship between that on into the future is going to be critical because whilst the mechanisms of what generates the surge are sort of on a daily basis on short term time scales, what happens on into the future under a warming climate may well uh, exacerbate the problems of surges. So we need to perhaps have a look at that as well and clearly linked to that would be forecasting um, or projections of surges on into the future and the modelling outcomes and the scale of storm surges and some examples. So there's quite a long list of things for us to get through. Um, not a great um, flow line diagram, but I circled around just to arrow you in. I, just to focus in, you can see the storm surge, uh, the primary feeders in uh, of coastal shape, of the low pressure systems, um, of cyclones or depressions, as they're perhaps more commonly referred to in the North Atlantic. But cyclones feeding into storm surges, the generation of winds, which are important, and then the repercussions of the surge right the way through into the social, economic um, and physical parts of, of, of our environment. 
So that, um, as a reference, I think is a very useful coastal textbook. It, I don't think, has been improved despite all of the upgradings that have gone on. It's Carter, C A R T E R, Carter, R W G, 1988. It's getting a bit old. I'm afraid Bill died some years ago and it hasn't been updated. But it's a very good integrated text that links physical systems, physical science of the coast with some of these management and repercussion areas. It doesn't deal with the satellite technology and things that I think you're going to be looking at in this course so much, but it does give you a very good coastal science background. Uh, there are other references that I'll come to more specifically. But that area of the whole management and the impacts of surges are dealt with by Carter. So definition, what is the surge? A very rough and ready one, it's my own, just making it up from different sort of sources. But a surge is a piling up or a bulge of water of the sea surface generated by a cyclone or depression, which is added to the normal regional scale, uh, to local scale, tidal and sea level signal. So essentially we have uh, our still sea surface, if you like, unperturbed sea surface, um, generated by uh, long-term controls of deglaciations and so on, which gives us present-day sea level. And on top of that, of course, as our depression or cyclone moves across the sea surface, it's the low pressure generated um, within the center of the cyclone and the wind systems, of course, associated with that cyclone as it moves around, um, circulating um, in the northern hemisphere um, from, as it were, anticlockwise and reverse in the southern hemisphere, basic physics of this, then we get that low pressure together with winds that causes this bulge of uh, the, the water against the coastline. And of course critical in that would be the shape of our particular coast. Different coastal shapes configuration will generate different types of surge signal. So, that's not exactly a surge, but you can see the idea, just gets you sort of a feel where we're looking at, um, you know, clearly a, a major wave generated by wind action on top of the sea, moving towards from the open sea surface areas, um, sea conditions as they're called, that then get organized into swell waves, and those waves then moving towards the coastline. And it's that piling up of water as a function of that, that movement that uh, is defining the surge. There is a little diagram uh, that illustrates these two major components, uh, the wind-driven um, element, which is, you can see, dominant in relation to this uh, non-scale diagram, but it illustrates that beneath our depression we have this wind-generated up of water, and a smaller component driven by around about 5% of the total um, uh, elevation of the sea surface comes from uh, the, the effect of the low pressure system. Another diagram, I think, that same, gives the same sort of uh, issue. It uh, illustrates, though, that the, um, the coincidence, in a sense, of the pressure element and the wind element may not be exactly the same. In other words, we get different delays and heights of surges as they move against a fixed boundary of a coastline. So the key drivers then, uh, wind stresses on the ocean surface, subject to, as we've said, wind, um, the dominant direction and velocity. Um, of course, the, the longer the fetch or the distance over which the storm is moving, then essentially we get larger generated waves, and so um, a, a bigger bulge of water potentially building against the coast. And so there are often linear relationships between distance and height of the sea surface, wind strength and height of the sea surface. Uh, those sort of relationships. Um, other factors that are, are important in, in defining the, the total elevation, you can see here is the tide, uh, long period waves within the water column uh, that are functioning sort of longer term, such as the Ekman currents, uh, Raleigh, um, Raleigh currents, and, and, and as I said, long, essentially long period waves. Um, also, of course, the uh, discharge of water coming down through estuary systems. Also, that meeting at the coast, as I've described for Cork, is also also going to create an additional water elevation to the onshore movement of the cyclone, the onshore movement of, of ocean water. So you can see a number of water controls, a number of physical factors involved. As a view, sort of this knitting ball 
uh, spaghetti type diagram that illustrates uh, wind speeds that are generated within uh, typical cyclones as, as sort of major storm cyclones with wind speeds greater than 20 meters per second. If one looked, as you can see, storm tracks between 1965 and 1994, this is an old piece of modeling work that was done based upon NCAR data, but you can see the, the principle. We have lots of storms tracking in towards, in this part of the world, Ireland's west coastline and on up into Scotland, across into um, Iceland in this direction. So where we are, we're particularly affected in this part of the North Atlantic by this um, focusing of major storm action onto North Atlantic European margin. But of course, uh, this type of wind activity affects North America, other coastlines as well. It's just the illustration of we're really in the center of a, a storm, um, storm corridor. Some of the earlier modeling work which we did, which basically when we put it into new models doesn't change dramatically, um, shows us that that uh, mass of red lines that shows the dominant storms coming in towards our coastline here in Ireland are uh, organized really into a series of uh, particular zones where in other words, there's greater frequency and some differences of these storms generating surge conditions. And here we're sitting in this one, uh, zone two, uh, which under uh, warming, climate warming, shows uh, some changes on into the future in this century, particularly that we would expect a little bit of movement southward. In fact, uh, that may be what we've been experiencing along our coastline just recently, um, is that the storms have been full on to the west coast of Ireland, as opposed to passing generally to the north into zone one. So we may see, although this, the, the statistics on this were sort of certainly not significant um, and they haven't changed, there's potentially, uh, under a warming, um, some movement of these corridors or zones further south in towards the Mediterranean. And what we do particularly see is an increase in the magnitude, the intensity, <coughs> um, with um, uh, time into the future, and also that we get... Um, not so much an increasing frequency, but increasing magnitude. And also, um, a decay of the storm, instead of decaying out here offshore, more of our storms are likely to decay closer to the coastline, which means that our surge conditions are going to be, you know, the intensity of the storm is going to be hit on the coastline. So our surges are likely to get bigger. Um, so greater magnitude storms, or more frequency of greater magnitude storms, and the intensity um, uh, as they decay moving on land. So there are a number of components then that are likely to cause increased surge conditions for us into the future. Now, as I said, surges, as I've just described, and very briefly defined them, are not tsunami. I suppose I could ask you as an audience, what is a tsunami? Um, uh, it's uh, obviously it's a, it's a harbor wave, is the classic interpretation from, from the Japanese. Um, those of you from Japan, they can tell you precisely what they are. Uh, Fukushima, of course, was affected by a major tsunami uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, so these are earthquake-generated uh, waves um, from the release of energy into the ocean water column. Of course, they generate a very large bulge of water against the coastline. Its characteristics are very different from a surge. You get drawdown initially, the sea retreats, um, the, the coastal zone is evacuated of water for a short period of time, and then the major pulse of water as a tsunami wave, not a tidal wave in the sense of a, a sun, moon, earth-generated tide, but this release of energy type wave. Um, but it creates that major bulge of water against the coast, which of course creates enormous damage, as we've seen in, as I said, the Fukushima example, but uh, uh, Durban in uh, 2008, I think, as well. But lots of tsunami uh, are generated around the world. But these are earthquake-generated phenomena. There you can see the effect of the Indian Ocean one in 2004. There's that um, first um, front of the tidal wave or the uh, tsunami wave coming in. And of course, people here, this is a classic shot off the web of people, of course, caught in that, um, <clears throat> that uh, situation. Most of those people, I'm sure, died. There's the effect of the tsunami um, on areas in Sri Lanka um, in 2004. You can see total devastation of the coastal zone. 
Now the significance in a sense to what you're going to be studying is that whilst this is the impact of the tsunami, surges can create very similar um, impacts in the sense of destruction. The stratigraphic and the coastal sedimentological signals are very different because of the way the mechanics of the two are, are quite different. But the impact, and that's the important thing from a practical management viewpoint, uh, is very much the same. Uh, there's from the Durban um, um, tsunami in South Africa, and you can see cars thrown up into buildings, destruction to buildings. Surges can do similar things, and we'll show some of those in a moment. So how do storm surges operate? Again, from Carter's book, as I said, what is critical in a sense is how these low-pressure systems track against the particular coastal configuration, the coastal position. So there's our block of land, here's a northern coast, a southern coast, here is our um, rotating cyclone, and you can see the signal in terms of the water rise initially here, um, onshore, offshore winds are recorded first, and then as the track of the depression moves through, we get, as it were, the onshore winds moving on. So you can see the signal of water level rise as initially we get very much um, uh, here initially a, a drawdown and then progressively on through time we get that positive rise of the sea surface. That same storm moving on the other coastline, as it were, the south side, will generate a somewhat different shape to the surge signal. They're both going to be surges, but the positive and negative effects will be the function of how the cyclone is interacting with the particular position of the coast. So that's important to, to remember. With that, as I said, we also see um, that we're looking at this elevation. And so in terms of looking at the normal sea surfaces as generated by tides, astronomical tides, background sea levels and so on, the effect of that bulge of water driven by the wind and the low pressure system, whereas low pressure, of course, allows is the sea surface to relax, if you like, and rise as simply you're, you're unloading the column of air above it, and so the water surface is able to respond and bulge upward. That's essentially the effect uh, as distinct from the effect of wind driving the water on shore. So that here, the residual, is essentially the result of those two things. The wind and the relaxation under low pressure, allowing the sea surface to rise above the astronomical tide and the background sea levels. The effect of that, in terms of the timing of it, you can see there's a difference between the residual and, of course, the tidal, the, the rate of the tide and so on. Um, but the effect of it in the Southern North Sea, in the, in the classic 1953 storm surge, was as the storm moved in from this direction across that coastal configuration, it generated a surge down through across these amphidromic points, the background tidal positions, as it were, superseding on top of the normal tidal projections. Uh, the surge generated across these down and of course was forced progressively into this shape, this funnel shape of the Southern North Sea. And of course the result was that bulge of water against the coastline. The effect upon the Netherlands was catastrophic. I think there were actually relatively low deaths, but uh, less than 2,000. Um, but significant damage and it of course kicked in the whole of the Dutch Delta plan 1953 on then they started to build major dikes um, revetments embankments polarization uh, also was was uh, added to by that stage again around the east coast here of England the same response major flooding particularly in the Thames estuary um, where I did my initial PhD work on the, the building of the Thames barrage um, work to do with that and um, interestingly now the Thames barrage is out of date. <clears throat> It was designed for the one in 100 year surge or thereabouts, and we are now beginning to see that we're going to be exceeding that position. So 1.9 billion spent upon the Thames Barrage, and we're going to be needing to add a lot more money to provide some sort of alleviation protection to central London. Um, so the barrage designs are very important to get it right in relation to what's going to be happening under climate warming into the future. But that sort of coastal configuration, with the effect of the storm, as I said, piling up water, causes this damage in these low-lying areas.
So how do storm surges operate? Critical run and storm tracking. Mechanisms, as I've said, the pressure field operation on the storm surge equals a little bit of the maths behind it. And you'll get, um, if you're not familiar with sort of the basic equations, the pressure equation here, um, defining the effect of that atmospheric pressure field as I've described it. You can see the text there defining the atmospheric pressure together with water density, gravity, etc. Those uh, continuity equations give us that essential pressure um, uh, that, 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 that defines the, the bulge of water. Um, the changes then, um, as we change those terms, particularly taking into account changes in the density of seawater, um, temperature, uh, all those effects, and of course the depth of water, all of those will lead to changes in the height of the water column. So those basic equations that define uh, the sea surface you'll find in Pew. Um, David Pugh, I think the, the, the reference is in your notes there, um, and uh, that book then gives you a little bit more detail about the mechanics of the storm surge. You can see here from um, that graph from Pugh's book that clearly as we get um, decrease here in our uh, pressure, so in other words the intensity of so those taking those uh, basic equations together as our pressure field uh, intensifies, low pressure um, builds, then we're going to get progressively increase in the height of our water surface. Well, there again, the drag on the sea surface here, drag which generates that wind-driven stress and piling up of water. So drag in that context defined as our stress field as a function then of these terms. Um, the CD is a dimensionless drag coefficient, uh, air density and our W in terms of the wind speed, the square of the wind speed. So you can see this is the critical term. So this is going to be um, driving the increase, um, not exactly linearly, uh, but close to. So it's the most dominant and important uh, term in the equation. So wind setup then, um, and we can see the slope of the sea surface. The slope is a function of the increase in level defined by horizontal distance, and that's what that graph uh, that I showed you earlier demonstrates. Our slope, the sea surface, is going to rise as a function of distance, um, the horizontal distance over which the wind is blowing. So those are critical terms. Essentially, it's called fetch. And there we go. Again, the graph that generates and defines that term. The previous graph showed you the effect of low pressure. Here, the graph shows you that slope, essentially is the distance over which the wind is blowing, leads to increasing elevation of the sea surface. Okay, so there is the reference then that gives you a little bit more of that background. Um, uh, you may not be interested in this part of it, um, so I'm just leaving that relatively light. But Pew, 2004, changing sea levels, effects of tides, weather, climate in CUP. So model projections um, for the UK and Ireland. Um, there's quite a lot of controversy in a sense about exactly whether our storm surges, as I've described, are going to get larger under a warming climate. Um, the early model projections suggested that we would get really quite large changes in surge conditions um, as we put different models together. The different modeling groups from UEA, um, the Tyndall Center in, the, in East Anglia, uh, to the whole range of them around the world from North America, Canada, and so on. The ensemble, putting those together as ensemble models, suggests that perhaps the effects of surges in some parts of the world are not going to be quite as large as was formerly thought. Um, this generating from the UK's um, 2009 projections uh, gives you, you can see the colours perhaps a little faint in this light, but we're looking at relatively small amounts of change. Um, um, of uh, this is the uncertainty of change, the surge heights. We can see many of our coasts here with small amounts of change in surge height in millimetres per year on um, into the future. Is that including? 
Uh, no, that's not. That's purely the effect of the surge, as I've described those mechanics of wind, and um, that's, that's an important point. Um, so it's purely the surge conditions, not coupled to sea level rise, independent of that, or any changes in the uh, tidal regimes as, as sort of part of bathymetric changes, changing amphidromic points and so on. <laughs> So yes. Clear, yes. That shows the relative change of the 50 year return level. Yeah. So it's the relative change in a statistical quantity, and the result that was published in UKCP09 yeah. was that there is no significant change that we can attribute. Yeah. That's what we concluded. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's what the map shows. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that the, the changes in search will be uh, the change in the level? Yes, means the mean sea level change will dominate changes of extremes. That's been a consistent message in IPCC ever since the fall of the settlement. Yeah. So there, as I said, there was there was some that that's been that refinement that's been going on, and sense of clarification of exactly what the surge signal will be on into the future. So there we can see from that, uh, the, the um, report that's just been referred to there, um, you can see the, uh, the text there that defines um, the, the impact of surges on sea surfaces on under that uh, climate modelling. For the, as it were, worst case scenarios, um, then we can see perhaps for the 50 return year uh, that... Um, as you said, the surge levels in places around, you know, reaching up to these sorts of levels. There are um, extremes, uh, certain sort of coastal configurations which will give, like the Thames Estuary, um, extreme surge conditions under a sort of a worst case uh, scenario on into the future. Uh, but hopefully we will not be in that position. The modelling that was done in the UK CIP 2009 and, and, and later uh, suggest um, that basically, as you said, that the surges are much smaller than previously thought. So storm surge impacts on coastal sediments and beach barrier destruction. Well, the effect, of course, of a surge in the same way as a tsunami is essentially to transfer sediments from our coastal systems uh, down uh, across um, initially the beach face out into deeper water. And you can see the flow patterns here as a longshore currents moving sediments in this direction, but also sediments moving down. Um, so a series of flows are referred to broadly as a longshore drift, but essentially also the release of sediment out from the coastline to deeper water, where it's essentially then stored for periods of time. So surges are important as part of the overall action of storms, of moving sediments around our coastlines, moving them out of storages in dunes, in beach barriers, um, and of course effectively increasing the vulnerabilities. So as our surges change, and perhaps the magnitude of them um, does get larger if, it, if that's happening, uh, then the result is going to be the impact on these barriers. Certainly with increasing sea level rise uh, and the surge coming in on top of these, we're likely to see greater impacts on our coastal barriers and more sediments being removed from our coast, having to then go into flux to move around and find a new depositional uh, sink um, or uh, centre for, for build-up. Uh, again, there you can see sort of diagrams illustrating the way which these coastal barriers uh, are going to be affected. And of course, houses, structures behind these, um, we tend to live in our coastal zones. Something like still 25 to 30 percent of the world's population is currently living in this sort of intimate association with coastal barrier systems or low-lying areas. Um, the predictions from the AR5 or the estimation is that we may be looking up to 50% of the world's population living in this sort of low-lying coastal, coastal setting, perhaps not as intimately connected to the sea as this one, um, but certainly very closely controlled by changes in coastal position. So the way in which storm surges operate on into the future, if population continues to move towards the coastline, is going to be really important. So these are more to do with how those barriers break down, uh, that storm surges tend to cause breaching. You can see with the breaching, water then flooding in behind and creating sort of the damage that the Dutch, uh, the, the Netherlands, would, would worry. 
Uh, some of the effects of that on our own coastline, uh, one can look at that background sea level from New Lynn, for example, and see looking at the uh, projections of, of wind regimes over time, we can get some idea of potential storm surges, those which are likely to create and the pattern of surges, these peaks here, on into the future. And work like that done by people like Carter and Orford have been used quite widely to illustrate how um, that potential for a surge to create major coastal change um, is in fact the driving force behind coastal changes. And here, uh, just put in a, um, one of that, uh, uh, the diagrams from work on um, Inch in Southwest Ireland, Inch Barrier, one of those coastal barrier systems, which suggests that the major surges here that happen on something like a 60-year, um, certainly a decadal time cycle, sort of a mesoscale time cycle of 60 years. Back in 1839, the big wind, as it was caused, probably very similar to the scale of winds we've just experienced, together with the surges associated with the 1903 uh, storm, severe storms. You can see the wind speeds greater than 31 meters per second on average. And in Hurricane Debbie in 1961, those certainly had major changes upon that coastal barrier in southwest Ireland. It broke down and then reformed as a function um, of the periods in between those major surges. So we can identify on coast particularly critical surge events that are tuned to the shape and structure and composition of the coast, and that surge is the thing that drives the way in which the coastal system operates. Well, there is that sort of model coming from the work of Orford and others um, on the inch barrier in uh, Southwest Ireland down in Dzimby No Dingle um, Bay at all. Perhaps you don't. Uh, but if you do, then you, you'll know this particular spit. And there is a, a concept, basically a conceptual model that shows the way in which essentially the effect of um, erosion under the storm uh, driving the coast back, periods in between, allows beach storage and accretion, and then the next major storm. Uh, driving the systems on. So a sort of a cyclical approach as a function of the critical storm uh, effects. Well, there we can see for rather an old diagram from, from Orford that shows, of course, that we do have um, longer period return waves, the 50-year uh, height. We can see that the heights of waves coming in that are driving our water against the coast can be large. Of course, as they come in towards the coastline, they modify. But we need to remember that point, that um, waves uh, are not always, of course, of the same size. They do vary dramatically. We have changes over quite long periods of time. So we can see the 50-year return period waves. So climate change on the future, as part of storm surges, will be changing those pattern, just a modeling of the way in which that sort of wave then interacts with our coast and moving our water up here into the Irish Sea, uh, creating, again, potentially high surge conditions, potentially high surge conditions. And there, with, um, from that particular report, again, um, forget the red areas, we can see the effect of here, uh, changes in mean annual winter maximum significant wave height. Again, linked to the surges, the wave height changes, um, which are uh, part of that storm signal. Now, as I said, the background to this is that um, under climate warming, uh, the AR5, the most recent of the IPCC reports, shows now looking at um, the uh, representative uh, carbon uh, concentrations as opposed to the old stress scenarios, uh, we can still see that sea level is shown as rising on into the future. So that background water level on which the surge uh, is, is built uh, shows rising sea levels on into the future. With the worst case scenarios here uh, on into the end of the 21st century of, you can see, reaching towards one meter sea level rise above the 1990, around about the 1990 uh, background recorded sea levels in 1990. So surge is then added to uh, what is here, you can see driving our normal sea surface, the sea level, um, as that sea level rises, our surges are situated on top of that rising sea level. So that's why I'm saying is that sea level rise is a really critical thing we need to, to, to take into account when looking at storm surge and their overall impacts into the future.
and that's just again a modelling from the UK CIP um, uh, of sea level rise for um, relative sea level rise for Ireland and the UK. Well, where will our future barriers be? I described um, the conceptual model for inch. Um, here, opposite inch, literally um, just to the south of it, uh, is this barrier called Ross Bay. And it's essentially a sand dune system, beach and sand dune system, sitting on top of a glacial um, end moraine, a recessional end. As the ice retreats, it's leaving debris behind it, and the sand material has moved under rising sea level in the past and has been sitting on top of that end moraine. And here, uh, the coastline you can see... Um, just to mark in on the slide. The red coastline indicates the uh, uh, survey position uh, undertaken by the local county council um, in 2008. And we can see at this point here a breach developed under a storm surge event and broke through. That has continued to enlarge. Um, areas of 19th century reclamation behind being protected by that barrier. There was the breach in 2008. And that's the photograph, which you can see the breach looking like. I think there's an expansion of that view there. So you can see that that was formerly a connected sand barrier system um, that has been functioning, has been resilient to storm surges up to this point in time. Unlike um, some of the other sorts of barriers along our coastlines, this one has been able to resist it. But 2008 is broken through. You can see that that um, uh, area... Uh, is in fact now growing. It's approximately like this distal end has completely disappeared. So our barrier has reduced right the way back. 1,400 meters of that barrier has disappeared as a function of initially the critical storm surge that broke through the system in 2008. And of course, the effect of that. As this changes, all of those hydrodynamics, all of the sediment surfaces and the water flows here are going to have to alter on into the future as this area changes. And there's the storm surge um, uh, barrier. That's the opening uh, at, at high tide. So you can see a completely different... We had before one single tidal inlet. After the surge, you had two tidal inlets. Now this end, as I said, has totally disappeared, and the dynamics of the system is going to change. Okay, well, now, the recent storm surges that we've had, just looking to see how much time, um, these recent storms um, on the root of that Ross Bay barrier, there you can see the storms uh, completely destroying what was the coastal road, pushing uh, sand and gravel and cobbles, shingle across here, uh, and destroying a lot of the car park areas behind. That impact um, is literally measured in terms of tens, hundreds of millions of euro, just in terms of the immediate storm damage created uh, along the west and, and south coasts of Ireland recently. There you can see some of that specific damage, uh, just, uh, just, just as I said, uh, in, in the last few, few months. In other parts of the world, uh, some of the effects of storm surges are um, more catastrophic, if you like, and certainly more um, horrendous as far as homeowners are concerned. Here, whole houses along the east coast of the United States uh, floating back out to sea from Delaware, for example, Carolina. You can see photographs of these sorts of events. Uh, flooding um, here in terms of the effect of Katrina uh, onto um, the Louisiana coastline, Mississippi. The areas of ground flooded under that Katrina event in 2004, again, 2005, around about then. Uh, you can see marked out in red. Are you positioning? <laughs> Okay. Um, again, from Hurricane uh, uh, Sophie, um, the impacts in red shown from the coastline here in, uh, in New York. So these are areas you can see that are marked in bright colours essentially are the ones that are going to be most vulnerable to surges and rising sea levels on into the future. And clearly that vulnerability is the thing that's most um, of concern to us. 
The impact upon people, um, there's a table uh, that I put into your notes there as part of the slide package. The 1970 cyclone in the Indian Ocean affecting Bangladesh, half a million people killed in that particular surge storm event. Of course, huge physical impacts in the way that I described earlier. Um, there's that table which gives you some of the uh, statistics of other of these events in other parts of the world. And uh, Katrina, you can see the effect on New Orleans. So the, the critical forward thinking of this is the need to not only one, understand what a storm surge is, what its mechanics are, how it will change on into the future, but then linking that knowledge as to, so how do you stop this taking place? Or what are your responses from a government management viewpoint? What are your responses to this? New Orleans was a complete disaster. Many said, okay, abandon New Orleans completely it's untenable on into the future. So as we understand exactly how our coasts are going to respond to storms, tsunami, then those are some of the impacts from the damages and the economic cost, looking at cost benefits as to uh, where we make our decisions about where we live on our coastlines. So built options. If you are going to build, um, then you need to allow, put them on stilts, use traditional building methods in the sense uh, of, of responses, uh, different sort of techniques. This is from Bangladesh, so it's not particularly, as it were, uh, pretty. But the idea, of course, is to allow your storm, storm surge bulge of water to pass underneath your building so you don't get the effect of that building in Carolina that it floats off out to sea. So it's not that innovative of the technology. You're borrowing from very traditional approaches but it's the sensible built response if you are going to build. Other responses, of course, would be don't build there at all. Um, retreat, shoreline um, uh, strategic retreat um, um, and, remo and, and uh, removing yourselves from the coastline is perhaps um, an option for, for many parts of our uh, coastlines. Others, those sort of traditional interventions of uh, building seawalls, revetments, riprap, as you can see there. In the Thames, the Thames Barrage, as I said, was constructed. There, you can see one view of it, um, to allow floodgates to be raised when a storm surge is predicted. And of course, this is what you're going to be looking at, particularly, I think, in this course, is the prediction, particularly from satellite information and integrated tide gauge, tide gauge networks, of um, how to project and to predict the timings of surges and to allow these sort of expensive structures. I think 1.9 billion was the ballpark figure quoted for the construction of this with the containment embankments going down the Thames back around about 20, 25 years ago. Nearly finished. Um, Thames Barrage, you can see, and it's all its glory. Um, it's probably now sort of as one of the wonders of the world, maybe, um, showing what it looks like. So there's those references. Um, Pew, uh, just as a sort of a very basic, simple approach to uh, changing sea levels and the surges within it. Carter, I did put that reference on, uh, and very sort of more contextual to um, what our surge is, is that open university text, which again I think is very good background. Waves, tides, and shallow water processes. So there, very briefly, are uh, some ideas about what are surges, and particularly what are the implications of surges for where we live and how we live on our fixed coastlines. The question is, they're not fixed, they will change on into the future, and surges will be important in creating what is called coastal squeeze. Squeezing us progressively into a narrower and narrower strip of coastline against the elevated rising land surface. So they have an important role in what is called as a coastal squeezing, diminishing the space we have to live at the coastline. Thank you.